Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Thank you and, um, for staying for a really exciting session this afternoon uh, in the lovely panoramic room. Uh, my name is Joyce. I am an anaesthetist by background and I work mainly in crystal care and research. And my co chair is Haley. Would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Haley Gershengorn. I'm a medical intensivist from uh, Florida in the United States. Great. So, um, really excited. We've got a great line of speakers. Uh, first of all, we've got Professor uh, Eli, uh, who's going to tell us all about um, where we stand and sort of state of the art. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, and hope everybody's having a good day today. It absolutely is as good as it gets in Belgium for weather. My name is Wes Ely. I am an intensivist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I am a, a, a Southern boy. You can hear my accent. And I'm from Louisiana. We used to ride them alligators to school, you know, damn man. And uh, this is Cajun country. I grew up in Louisiana, and we have a lot of uh, spicy hot food down there. So if you ever want to come down for Mardi Gras, you can come and enjoy my, that's my area of the country. I'm going to talk to you about where we stand with delirium. And I'm going to do it by way of asking you some questions to begin with. Delirium in the ICU has been proven over numerous studies extremely consistently to be a very robust predictor of four major things for our patients. One of them is length of stay. One of them is cost of care. One of them is death. And the fourth one is acquired brain dysfunction or dementia. So if you go by concern for patient outcomes of X is a predictor of Y, and if X is delirium duration, and that predicts how long somebody stays delirious, predicts how long they're in, this, in, this, in the system, how much it costs, how often they die, with a 10% increased risk of death per day, and a 35% increased risk of long-term cognitive impairment per day. Those are some numbers for you to take home. So let me ask you a question. Where do we stand with delirium? Raise your hand. Are, do you think in your ICU that you have more delirium than you would like to have for your patients? Okay, this might be obvious. How about this? Do you think during COVID that we started overusing sedation? Raise your hand. Okay. Do you think that we mobilized patients less during COVID? Okay, and I'm going to have, ask you one more question, and I'm going to tell you why I asked you those questions. Do you think that we reduced the amount of family involvement during COVID? Okay, so the strongest two interventions by which you can reduce delirium are to get the patient out of the bed. Numerous studies showing mobility reduces delirium, cuts it in half. And the second one is have a loved one at the bedside to engage with the person with family. So almost all of you raised the hand that we, we reduced family engagement during COVID and we stopped mobilizing patients during COVID. So those are our two best treatments for delirium. And the third best is reduction of sedation, over, re reducing overuse of sedation. So the three main tools that we have to allow somebody's brain to come back on track in the ICU we ditched during COVID. And I said this this morning, but pre-COVID in 40 countries, we had compliance rates with those three things in the neighborhood of 60 to 80%. And during COVID, a Japanese investigator named Katz was very aggressive in helping us get these data. International study showing that those interventions were down to five to 10%. All right, one last question, and I'll keep talking, quit bothering you. Raise your hand if you're satisfied that we are back to our pre-COVID ICU care and you think we're all the way back to where we were. Exactly. We are still suffering from a problem with what happened to us during COVID. So the question was, where do we stand with delirium? Delirium is a barometer of ICU quality care. That's what, think of it like that. Think of your delirium rate as a barometer of how well we are doing in the ICU. And I am guilty. I am not back to the way I was pre-COVID either. I'm trying hard to get us back. But we as a community, and we're all in this together, butterfly effect, right? 
Butterfly waves that, waves that wing, that wind's going to change globally. We are all connected as an ICU community. So I thought a lot about what I would say in this entry talk to you. And I hope you don't mind me not using slides. I just wanted to engage us and get us started with this thing, talking eye to eye with one another. What I feel is discontentedness. I feel unhappy. I feel frustrated about my own ICU and where we are. And maybe you feel the same way. And is it okay for us to have done away, essentially, with mobility and family engagement and gotten back to the 1990s with over sedation and all that business. I don't think it's okay. It's terrible for the patients. And it's terrible for me because I feel burned out when I'm carrying around a sense of guilt. And for many years, I, I, as, an, as an intensivist, prior to getting gray like this, I was really feeling guilty about the way I was as a physician. I thought, you know, I, there's something wrong with what I'm doing at the bedside with my patients. I'm not treating them as a whole person. I'm being driven by the data and the monitors and the, and, the, and the technology. And why I got into this was so that I could love people and hold their hand and look in their eyes and see them as an entire person. Robert Frost said, if I get this right, when was it ever less than a treason to go with the drift of things, to give way to grace and reason? What he was saying was, Let's not just give in to the tides of change if we don't think that they're correct. And so in critical care, what I think the challenge we have before us is this. We have the data. We do not have to go back and reinvent the data. Between 2005 and 2020, here's what happened. And here's the data. In 2000, 2001, we invented a way to measure delirium the CAM-ICU, and the ICDSC. Between 2001 and 2006, we began implementing that globally. Between 2006 and 2010, we did about four to eight large randomized controlled trials. The MEN's study, the SEDCOM, ABC study, um, Thomas Strom's no sedation study, numerous investigations, Schweikert's uh, early mobility study. And those became the, the, the building blocks for a safety bundle in the ICU. And I said earlier today, I was opposed to this idea at first because I had an ego and I thought, you know what? I'm a great doctor and I know what the hell I'm doing. And don't tell me a menu of how to do it in the ICU. But after I got over myself, I realized I'm not at the bedside enough. The, 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 the clinicians keep changing. Everybody has their own idea about how to do something. And no company would ever allow such destandardization of care. Any major company is going to standardize the way that they build their cars or build their computers. And a person is way more valuable than a car or a computer. So why am I not going to ensure that they get the safest, most effective care? And what we showed over that five to six year period was that we could reduce death by 15% absolute. We could reduce length of stay. We could improve consciousness and reduce delirium. We could also in improve engagement with nurses and that helps nurses to get less burned out. And then me as a physician, I'm carrying less guilt because I know we're providing better care. So I have a longer career myself and I go home at light less angry with my family, shedding all this stuff to them, bringing my frustrations in the house. Then in 2013, we showed the New England Journal in the Brain ICU study that delirium was a strong predictor of dementia. And then something very interesting happened. And this is the end of the data the data delivery for you, and I'll bring it to a close. Early, and we'll have some time for questions. So the, we started going around to international in, uh, medical centers and implementing this on a large scale and measuring what we found. And what we found in 30,000 patients was there was a dose response. I didn't talk, talk about this this morning. A dose response on graphs. So we published this in Critical Care Medicine. Brenda Pun's the first author, if you want to find it. Pun B, and I'm the senior author, Ely E.W. Uh, it's the ICU Liberation Study. And on multiple graphs, we have dose response and outcomes. And what we showed was that the higher percentage of implementation of waking people up, getting them out of bed, measuring for delirium. And by the way, what do you do when you measure for delirium? At the bedside, my nurses say, our, our, our nurses uh, say, Dr. Ely, Dr. Wes, 
We, the patient's delirious this morning, they're CAM positive. We ran the Dr. Dre, and here's, how we, here's what we need to do. What do they mean? Dr. Dre is this famous rapper in the US, and the nurses invented this, this acronym, Dr. Dre. Diseases, drug removal, environment. So our clinicians actually use this at the bedside. Diseases, drug removal, environment. Dr. Dre, this, this rapper that everybody loves. He sang at the Super Bowl last year, if you saw that, that, that show, showing. And so they think, they say, Dr. Ely, this patient's delirious today. They weren't delirious yesterday. And so we ran the Dr. Dre, and we got a higher white count today, and their x-ray has infiltrates on it. We think they're getting septic. Or their sepsis is controlled, but they're on two deliriogenic drugs, Benadryl and a benzo, or, you know, pick your, pick your deliriogenic drug. Or the diseases seem controlled. We've already gotten rid of the, we went with our PharmD and we got rid of deliriogenic drugs, but their, their environment is the problem. They haven't gotten out of bed. The lights have been off all day yesterday. They've lost their sleep-wake cycle. Or their vision and hearing are impaired and they don't have their glasses or their hearing aids. And we're going to get the family there at the bedside today. So that's how we run delirium at the bedside in terms of management. And um, when you have a dose delivery that's higher, so you go from 0% compliance to 20% to 40% to 80% compliance, very consistently across numerous studies, higher compliance, less death, shorter length of stay, less ICU bounce backs, less nursing home transfers, and less delirium and coma. So this was really cool. I, I never thought we'd see this. For 10 years of measuring delirium, we had a rock solid, steady, 70% delirium in mechanically ventilated patients. Every time we measured this in ventilated patients, delirium rates were at 70%. And I really was beginning to think we'd never make a dent in it. Then the ICU liberation program came on board, SCCM endorsed it, we ran these studies, and we did four multi-center RCTs between 2016 and 2019, right before COVID. And guess what happened? All four of those studies showed delirium rates on ventilated patients of 40 to 45 percent. It was the first time in almost 20 years that we had consistently seen delirium rates almost cut in half because people were doing these proven steps and it worked. So let me review. We went through and did individual RCTs, then we put them together as a bundle, and then the RCTs that were done afterwards that measured delirium saw the reduction. That's all still there. Then COVID hit and it all went to hell in a handbasket. And now we are where we are. So what are you going to do about it? And what am I going to do about it? We've got to build the culture back that helps us to unlearn. In Tao Te Chi, I think it's number 65, Buddhism, it says the ancient masters taught the students to unlearn, to know that they didn't know. Because if they think they know, their cup is full and they cannot learn. We have to unlearn what we learned in COVID. And there's lots of COVID nurses and COVID doctors out there who came of age during COVID. And they think that you take care of people with heavy doses of benzos and immobilization and no family. Can't we together as a community unteach those lessons and rebuild? Those are my thoughts. I'm done a tiny bit early. I think that's where we are with delirium. And I appreciate all of you. Um, a really good talk and I think set the scene of our session really well um, so thank you very much you. Um, can I invite any comments or questions um, for our don't, session we've don't got be a, bashful yeah we've got a roaming mic so if you do put your hand up then you have to just wait for the mic to come to you what's on your mind how do you disagree with what I said please let's I'm, be a community that shares I'm going to take Dr. Dre back to my intensive please care sir. unit please <laughs> Um, just wait one second. It's just coming. Yeah, Dr. Dre is really good. It's sticky. People remember it. It's easy. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Stephen Smith, uh, Portland, Oregon. So uh, I don't disagree with anything you said in terms of what we should be doing. I wonder if um, we can be certain that the sedation is causing the delirium or we're just it's just leading us to... Uh, uh, see that the patients are sedated and therefore we're scoring them as delirious when they're sedated. 
I, I don't argue with the point that we should not use sedation. I like your question. So your question is, is it truly delirium or is it sedation that's creating their brain not to work? So this is a semantics thing, but I'm really glad you asked the question. What we do at the bedside is first, sir, to measure, does the brain have the capacity for attention right now? Does it have the capacity to organize thought? Because those are the two cardinal features of delirium. You're delirious if you're inattentive or have disorganized thinking. So you can say to me, well, sedation in decreases your capacity for attention and, it, and it, it removes your ability to organize your thinking. And so what I'm going to say to you is, yes, I go to the bedside and we have a tool. And we say, Ms. Smith, squeeze my hand whenever I say the letter A. S, A, V, E, A, H, A, A, R, A. So she lost her ability to pay attention. She was paying attention for five seconds and she quit, right? So I'm measuring, is she paying attention? Can she organize her thinking? Ms. Smith, hold up this many fingers. Okay, do the same thing with the other hand. Okay, that's organizing your thinking. She's at a process. I never said two. I didn't repeat the command. She processed all of that. So that's all part of the CAM ICU. That's basically the CAM ICU, what I just showed you. It's that easy. So I'm not figuring out when I'm measuring that what's causing it. I'm just seeing, is it there? Is there delirium present? Because she, if she can't do those things, she's delirious. Then I ask myself, what are the likely causes of this positive CAM? And on the list for this patient would be sedation. But on the list also would be diseases, drugs that should be removed, and environmental factors. So we don't grade delirium on or off sedatives. We just grade it, is it there? And then we ask ourselves, how can we improve the situation? Does that make sense? One more question, sir. sepsis thanks in the midst of sepsis it's just plain neurotransmitter chaos and that's delirium or must it be inorganic delirium doesn't have delirium is a global phenotypic external expression of the brain not being able to do what it's supposed to do so we need to have an acceptance of the fact that it is essentially shock for the cardiovascular system or desaturation for the lung and then we go and find out why are they desaturating or why are they in shock? And delirium is your pulse ox for the brain. So think of it like that. And it could absolutely be organic because of lack of blood flow or neurotransmitter or inflammatory circumstances, or it could be iatrogenic because we did something. So we don't, we don't, we find out is it, pre, are they in shock or are they desaturating? Then we go back and we say, why is this organ failing? And I told you earlier, the two best interventions are get that family there, get them out of the bed. But to get them out of the bed, guess what you have to do? Stop the sedation. So those are some thoughts. Commit ourselves to change. Let's go back to the goodness we had pre-COVID. And all the data are there. Knowledge is power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ely. Um, we now have the pleasure of our next speaker, Frank Van Herren, who will be talking to us about how sleep disturbances and delirium are related. How, do, how am I scoring on the delirium scale at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> I lost my cable. So I'm just going to give exactly the same talk, but then with slides. <laughs> Thanks, Wes. It was inspirational, as always. Um, but I'm going to combine it with talking about sleep, and that's a pretty tough task just after lunch uh, to try and keep you awake um, and try and get your uh, non-fluctuating levels of attention. So I have no relevant disclosures for this talk, and I think it is important that we know what we're talking about when we talk about delirium. A lot of it has already been said by, by Wes, um, so there will be some repetition, but the definition is pretty clear. This is the DSM-4, uh, in fact, the DSM-5 definition. It has to be an acute organic brain dysfunction. There are disturbances of attention and cognition. It's fluctuating, that's very important. And it has, uh, it's there because of an underlying medical condition. And as Wes said, and he invented the ChemICU, we have these two tools um, since 20 years now, ChemICU and the ICDSC. 
I just find chemise shoe better because it's easier to say for me my, with my Dutch background living in Australia. I always struggle to say IC. I never know whether it's IDC or ICD. Anyway, they're, they're both pretty good. But you need to be aware of some of some of the differences between the two scales, especially in sedated patients, and you touched on that, and we did a small study in that we compared the two, um, the, the two scoring systems in sedated patients um, and in non-sedated patients, and we found that when patients are more deeply sedated, uh, the chem ICU is more likely to say that the patient is delirious than the other two, but when the patients are awake, it's the other way around. It's about a factor two. So you need to know these sort of baseline characteristics of the tools you use. Uh, it doesn't mean that one tool is better than the other, but there is an impact of sedation, as was already explained. Now, there are different types of delirium. That's also important to recognize. Um, there's hyperactive, hypoactive, and mixed, and we know from uh, for example, this, this excellent scoping review that in ICU, in fact, the hypoactive delirium is the, is the most common form. It's also the most difficult one to diagnose. It's much easier when your patient is agitated and pulling out the tube and lines, but the hypoactive is more difficult to diagnose. As doctors, we are more likely to do something when patients are agitated because then they're clearly dangerous to themselves and to other people. Um, so in this study, it was clear that we're more likely to give something, some drug, to treat that agitation and that hyperactive delirium. Then, you know, this whole conference has been full of um, individualized treatment and, and, and targeting uh, and phenotypes. Delirium have, has phenotypes as well. There's a number of studies, including a recent paper by Wes, um, and these different phenotypes, they can have overlap, but the different phenotypes have also different outcomes. So the sedation-related delirium or sedative-related phenotype has a much better outcome, long-term outcome, than, for example, when it's caused by hypoxia. Hypoxic delirium has quite a significant long-term cognitive dysfunction. We've heard it's common, it has a significant impact on outcome, short-term, long-term, increased cost. Um, I invite you to go to the website of Nancy Andrews. She's a patient who was delirious in ICU. She has a website um, uh, and she, she writes about it. It's really quite, um, well, it gets to you. And you see what actually happens to the patient and how terrifying it can be to have delirium in intensive care. Um, and as he was saying, that's her quote, you're trying to save my life, but it feels like you're trying to kill me. So we need to do something about this, prevent. Um, we talked about long-term outcomes. One specific thing that one of my PhD students, uh, a psychologist, looked at is PTSD. And she looked at patients with or without delirium after six and after 12 months. And after 12 months, there was really quite a significant proportion in patients who just had an episode of delirium. We didn't even measure the duration, but just having had delirium in ICU was a significant predictor of post-traumatic stress after 12 months. And this was an independent risk factor for post-traumatic stress in this, in this study. Can we predict which patients get delirium? Um, I'm really going to not, not um, spend too much time on this, um, but um, my Dutch friends, and I was part of this as well, uh, have basically developed two prediction models, um, two tools, the pre-deliric, which essentially uses 10 predictors, 10 risk factors, 10 predictors within the first 24 hours of ICU admission, and that, that was reasonably well predictive of delirium with a sensitivity of 0.7 and a specificity of 0.7. Um, and then um, we looked at predictors at ICU admission because otherwise you need to wait for 24 hours. You know, if you have some predictors that you can use when the patient is wheeled in and you can immediately say this patient is at high risk for delirium. So there was another model created, the early pre-deliric with nine predictors and that sort of performed equally reasonably well with sort of an AUC of 0.7. So there are risk factors, and I meant to mainly talk about sleep, but as Wes said, sedation is the main risk factor, especially benzodiazepines. You really want to try and make your ICU as benzodiazepine-free as possible. That's my, uh, my view, and I think it's, it's based on the best available evidence. Sleep in hospitals is terrible. This was a study we did in, when I worked in Canberra, my previous hospital, um, and 
we found that almost half the patients, this is not in ICU, just in hospital, almost half the patients uh, tell us that they have poor to very poor sleep quality. And their interpretation of their sleep is different from what the nurses tell us. The nurses say, oh, no, it was okay. Yeah, the patient slept all night. And you ask the patient, and the patient had a terrible night. This also comes back in some of the questionnaires that we use to measure sleep. There are nursing questionnaires and patient questionnaires. And, uh, you know, I think from our work and others, um, nurses generally underestimate, sorry, overestimate the sleep duration and the sleep quality of patients. So there's a lot of consequences uh, of bad sleep in ICU. But when you talk about sleep, how do you measure sleep? You know, so you can use these questionnaires that I talked about briefly. But the gold standard is polysonography. But in ICU, that's quite problematic. There's interference. It's a, it's a bunch of uh, equipment. You need to have specialized people that have been trained to read and measure it. Um, I talked about the questionnaires. They have pitfalls. And when patients are very unwell, you can't ask them whether they slept well or not. Um, what about actigraphy? So, just wearing this, this watch, um, you know, we all have one. My, my watch tells me how much I sleep, but of course these ones are medical devices, so they're 20 times more expensive and do exactly the same. But um, so this, another PhD student looked at actigraphy in intensive care patients, and she found when she compared it with polysomnography, it is quite reasonable. It's not fantastic. It underestimates sleep and it overestimates wakefulness. But when you just look at patients who are a bit more uh, conscious, then it performs much better. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that. So we need to measure sleep. We need to be mindful of sleep when you want to implement sleep uh, bundles. Sleep and delirium have a bi-directional relationship. Um, you know, when patients don't sleep, they're more likely to become delirious. When they're delirious and lose their day-night pattern, they're more, more likely to not sleep. So one thing is, can't we just give melatonin, right? I mean, we use it for jet lag, and some people may use it for sleep. Um, and there is actually not, a, not an unreasonable sort of biological plausibility, um, because in critically unwell patients, we know that melatonin regulation is abnormal. Um, in fact, there's a, a lower level of melatonin after a while of critical illness, and then they get into the cycle of not sleeping and getting delirious. In non-ICU patients, this has been tested. Um, in elderly patients in hospital, three milligrams versus placebo, um, where they looked at sleep and delirium, and this was not effective. In hospitalized non-ICU patients in this study, there was no reduction in delirium and, and sleep fragmentation was still bad. So we looked at this in, um, in ICU patients and this was led by Brett Wybro from uh, uh, Western Australia. Um, and so we randomized 850 patients um, into melatonin, four milligrams every evening for up to 14 days versus placebo. Um, so it went well. Um, I won't give you all the details, but essentially it didn't work. There was no reduction in delirium. That's what this graph shows. There was no reduction in mortality. That was also not a plausible endpoint, but we measured it anyway. But patients also didn't sleep more or better. We had some subgroup analysis where we measured sleep with polysomnography and other, other methods. So melatonin giving to ICU patients routinely it didn't help, it didn't reduce delirium, it didn't improve sleep, it had essentially no effect. Very disappointing, uh, well to me anyway, because I'd much rather say give melatonin because it's fantastic and everyone should have it, but that's not the case. So where do we go then? How can we improve sleep and delirium? And we've, we've heard uh, before um, that it's, it's, there are multiple components, uh, and this has been really well studied in non-ICU patients, and this recently updated meta-analysis shows that when you, when you put in a bundle, a multi-component bundle to prevent delirium in non-ICU patients, um, that's actually quite effective. It reduces the incidence of delirium, it reduces the duration of delirium in patients who still get it, it reduces hospital length of stay. What about in ICU? Well, again, Wes has shown this, we have the bundles, it's been published in the guideline, 
and, and very well validated and published by Wes, you know, the A to F or the ABCDF bundle is essentially a proven way to improve um, sleep and delirium in these patients, in ICU patients. When you unpack that, there's a couple of components that are important that I want to highlight. One is noise. Noise is very disruptive. And we measured this in our intensive care, not my current one, but the previous one. And I was shocked when I saw the results. I'll show you. Just, just, a, just a normal ICU. Um, these were the noise levels. I'll just draw a line. This is what the WHO tells us. The noise level shouldn't exceed 30 decibels in a hospital. So the mean noise levels were twice that. The peak noise levels were 80 to 90. That's a lot of sort of airport level noise. It's heavy traffic. And then there's all these vari variability, which is probably even worse. When you have a constant loud noise, it's probably not as disruptive as when you have these huge you know, vari variations in noise. So this is shocking. What can we do about that? Well, um, we published this a little while ago. There's, there's behavior modification bundles where you can, you know, you can implement that. You can do all sorts of things uh, in terms of what shoes people wear in ICU, the workflow, the, the volumes of your alarms. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things. This has to constantly be re, you know, people have constantly to be reminded because often people forget after a while, or you know, a lot of bundles when you implement them have. Um, a certain duration that they work well, and then you have to keep reminding people. Um, simple things work. Earplugs work. This was a meta analysis from Ed, Ed Litton in 2016 that shows that if you use earplugs to improve sleep, you also reduce delirium in ICU. And more recently, there's been a couple of studies that have uh, confirmed that. So this was a small RCT, 84 patients. They used earplugs and eye masks and looked at sleep and delirium. First of all, the perceived noise was much lower by patients. Their sleep was much better. Uh, this was a questionnaire. And with the, the other chem ICU, the ICDSC, <laughs> um, there was significantly less delirium. So simple things like this can work. Another sort of before after study where an, a bundle was uh, implemented in a slightly larger patient group. And again, it's minimizing sounds at night, earplugs, eye masks, and during the day, get the daylight in, you know, get patients out of bed, promote physical activity, and it works. There was a significant reduction in delirium, the time to delirium, but also the incidence of delirium and the proportion of days that patients had delirium. Now, we've heard a lot about early mobilization, uh, I think, in this, during this conference, and we have to be a little bit careful. You know, the team study um, showed us that there is uh, potential of harm when you do it too aggressively and too early. And certainly, in my unit, we used to do a lot of this, where patients are still intubated and already walk around. I think we have to be a little bit careful, and we have to implement it um, in a cautious way. But early mobilization absolutely reduces delirium. Get patients out of bed, wake them up, get them out of bed, and you have almost a halving of the delirium risk. Finally, we talked a little bit about sedation. Uh, the first author of this paper sits right in front of me here. Um, this is a, a study where patients who, a very specific group of patients, who patients who were as essentially ready to be extubated, but they were too agitated to be safely extubated. If you then give dexmedetomidine versus placebo, you have a really quite wonderful effect in terms of um, how quick the tube came out, how long they remained on the ventilator, um, so hours to extubation, but also, and this was interesting, a quicker resolution of delirium. So there appears to be an anti-delirium effect of dexmedetomidine. In, on top of maybe the other effects that it has. And this has been um, confirmed in other studies. I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just showing one, but there's a lot of ongoing studies with dexmedetomidine. It's certainly not you know, the magic bullet, but in terms of, um, of, a, of a useful um, sedative in these patients. So this was a study where um, nightly dexmedetomidine uh, reduced ICU delirium. Um, anyway, this is just to, uh, this is a, 
pretty useless slide, but just to get your attention back again. Um, so to take home, delirium is significant. It's, 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 you know, we have it very often and it has a major impact on patient outcomes. Sleep and delirium are intertwined. They have a bi-directional relationship. So we need to target sleep as well. When you want to really measure sleep, you, you probably want to look at uh, a little bit more than just questionnaires and actigraphy seems to be a reasonable alternative. Melatonin, unfortunately, doesn't help in our patients in ICU. It doesn't prevent delirium and it doesn't improve sleep. And I think prevention, and we've already heard that, prevention and treatment of delirium requires a multimodal approach, a bundled approach, and this does include implementing interventions to reduce noise and to optimize sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk on sleep and delirium. I'm just looking around. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Van Herren. Uh, yes, in the front, just wait. I think the microphone is coming. Can we have the microphone here? Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, hyperactive delirium is the commoner one and more difficult to pick up. So I think a close differential diagnosis could be uh, non-convulsive seizure. And uh, that has, you know, implications otherwise. So, you know, how do you differentiate clinically and which are the cohort of patients who should undergo EEG to pick up non-convulsive seizure? Sure, thank you for your question. I think patients who are more sleepy, more drowsy, um, and not easily arousable, I think the differential for those patients is, is quite wide. I mean, it, 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 in, it includes non-convulsive status, perhaps, although that, I think that's quite uncommon and rare, but I think there's a whole other list of potential reasons that people can be, you know, less, less easy to rouse, including metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities, sepsis, uh, and of course, brain pathologies. So I think, I think um, it's just a proper clinical assessment and evaluation of the patient uh, and looking at risk factors, risk factors for seizures, and then make a decision whether you need an EEG. But I would, I would argue that most people probably wouldn't need an EEG in that situation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the other? Oh, wonderful. Um, Can you wait for the microphone one second? I'm used to be deaf, that's all. <laughs> that's another important thing. Get your patients, get their glasses and their hearing aids back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. Uh, no, thank thanks you. for the talk, first of all. Um, my question was, what do you think of higher doses of melatonin? Uh, yesterday there was uh, a talk about giving a higher dose, 10 milligrams in patients. Um, there's a paper by Gandolfini et al, 2020, so after the uh, Paris guideline 2018, which showed that a higher dose, up to 10 milligrams of uh, melatonin, had improved sleep, qu sleep quality in patients. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent question, and we just bef just before um, this session, we had a big chat, a quick chat about this. Um, it may be a dose effect. I mean, we used a dose that was based on previous um, not previous studies, and also on measured melatonin levels. Uh, we measured melatonin levels, and they were absolutely quite quite good. When you gave four milligrams, there's a reasonable biological availability. But it's possible. It's possible that there's a dose-effect relationship. And certainly, I heard from one of our colleagues uh, from Sydney that he, for um, uh, uh, to, uh, to treat his uh, jet lag, that he takes 20 milligrams uh, before he goes to sleep. And then when he still wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning, he takes another 20 milligrams. So, you know, and he's still alive. He, stay, he, just, he still gave, <laughs> gave talk. It's not Rinaldo. It's someone else. <laughs> So um, there may be a dose-effect relationship. Um, so all I can say from our work is that this dose had absolutely no effect. So there was no, not even a direction. There was basically no difference at all versus placebo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, we're going to welcome Dr. Kanastov. Stovkaya, I'm not going to pronounce that correctly, am I? Uh, from Mayo Clinic. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a privilege and an honor to be here today, and I thank Jean Louis for courage to invite me here. It's a sign of changing times that in a session on delirium, we're going to be talking about a gut. 
Not the first thought that everybody has when they think about delirium, perhaps. But if you think of what makes us human, some people think it's our cells that make us human, but we only have half, half of our cells only are human. The rest are bacterial cells. If you think of maybe it's our genes that make us human, well, for about 20,000 human genes, we have about 20 million bacterial genes. So we're essentially a walking ecosystem. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer to microbiome as bacteria, but it encompasses archaea, viruses, fungi, and all of their genomes. It's an entity that's very dynamic throughout the lifespan. It's influenced by a whole number of factors, and uh, it increases in diversity until about the age of 12. It's somewhat stable in adulthood and then decreases with aging. Over 35 species of bacteria have been isolated. Most of them are anaerobes. You would wonder, why am I talking about it? Why is it relevant? Well, the function, the microbiome, plays a major role in our metabolism. It comprises most of our immune system. It provides ours with vitamins, amino acids, and the bacteria ferment the fibers, producing short-chain fatty acids, which, from the brain-gut axis, have a lot of influence on the neuroendocrine cells and various cells in the brain and uh, in the experiments, infusion of uh, short-chain fatty acids could restore the microglia and short-chain fatty acids may have uh, something to do with production of neurotransmitters. They have a lot of other functions. They have anti-oncogenic effects, they mediate satiety, they mediate multiple, multiple metabolic functions, they protect uh, the gut barrier integrity. From the point of view of a microbiome, you want to have a diverse microbiome. Studies on centenarians and supercentenarians, people who live healthy into the age of over 100, revealed that they have one unique characteristic. They have very diverse gut biomes. What, what about most of our gut biomes? Well, the combination of processed food and uh, daily, multiple times a day, washing our hands with those uh, mystery solutions in the hospital, antibiotics and all the other various exposures that we have likely do not put us in the same category as the centenarian population. And uh, paucity of microbiome diversity has been linked to pretty much every chronic illness out there, including the brain-gut axis, which I will talk about more today. What is the brain-gut axis? It's basically the communication between what's in your gut, the bacteria that secretes various metabolites, chemical signals, immune signals, neural signals, and uh, through the neural connections and the, the blood work, it goes to the brain and the, the signals go back and forth. So a disruption in the gut changes the secretions of short-chain fatty acids and uh, their metabolites, and it directly affects uh, the brain function. So lots of connections have been found between that and outcomes. What happens to the patients who land in the ICU? Within the first six hours, most of the gut diversity that they have is lost. A big factor in that is the cytokines from the inflammation that change the tight junction proteins in the gut, leading to gut hyperpermeability, translocation of the bacteria, immune system deranged activation, inflammation, apoptosis of epithelial cells, and the shift in microbiome towards what's known as pathobiome. On top of that, pretty much everything we do is being linked to impairment in microbiome of our tube feed, some of the ingredients, the antibiotics in particular, the PPIs, the opiates, everything we give has been linked in separate studies to decrease in biome diversity and uh, growth in pathobiome. So why is it relevant in this context? Well. Patients who survive critical illness frequently suffer with mental health problems and cognitive impairments. In non-ICU literature, I couldn't find anything with mental health and biome in the ICU. Problems with uh, having infection, use of antibiotics, uh, stress uh, usually causes dysbiosis, which has been linked to pathogenesis of depression. And uh, changing your diet and uh, or fecal transplant has been shown to be associated with resolution of depression. There's a lot of connections that are just beginning to be uncovered between the gut and the brain, 
And uh, those connections leading to shift in the theory of how mental health is viewed by psychology providers. Previously, the combination of stress and genetic susceptibility was thought to be the driver behind the various psychopathology we observe, and uh, usually you get psychotherapy or medication as a, a treatment option. Right now, it's the combination of you looking at the diet, you're looking at antibiotic use, the lifestyle factors, all of these are known to play a major role in the pathogenesis of mental health problems that we observe. And treatment could include psychobiotics or prebiotics or fecal transplant or healthy diet. So in general, it's been beginning to get recognized that the combination of the Western style diet with the processed uh, saturated fats and simple carbs uh, usually leads to dysbiosis, which uh, then causes leaky gut, uh, bacterial translocation and immune system activation and through that it causes neuroinflammation and various uh, mental health problems. So in terms of cognition, the state of dysbiosis has been linked with neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration, for example, in pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. There is also a concept of inflammaging, which is poor microbiome uh, being associated with various inflammatory biomarkers and uh, enhanced aging and uh, worse outcomes. There's also been connection to autism, schizophrenia. And in terms of general cognitive function, a study on fairly young people, mean age of 50, in a part of a cardiac study, looking at their performance on MOCA and digital symbol substitution tests, did reveal that there was a connection between diversity of their biome and performance on those measures. In neurocritical care, the brain injury leading to problems with blood-brain barrier permeability and uh, harmful cytokines does affect the bio, which in turn makes uh, the brain injury worse. So this connection has been recognized. But what about delirium? The activation of toll-like receptor 4 has been shown to cause uh, inflammation in the brain, which has been linked to septic encephalopathy. Specifically, in mice studies, uh, they looked at uh, mice that were randomized to either sham procedure or abdominal surgery, and they looked at the diversity of the biome of the mice after the, sham su after the surgery to see how well they were doing on those mice-specific tasks like uh, finding a way in the maze and other stuff that they usually do to look at mice cognitive performance. And they noticed that uh, mice who had trouble with those tasks had a deranged uh, microbiome specifically for the mice, bacteroid dales uh, percentage was low, and that's the healthy biome for them. And then they took the stool from the mice uh, with poor cognitive tasks, and uh, the mice that didn't have poor cognitive performance, they transplanted it to normal mice, and uh, basically the mice uh, that did not have poor cognitive performance, um, they did better as opposed to the mice that uh, received transplant from those who had uh, impairment cognition. Uh, in humans, literature is emerging a lot uh, from surgical field for connection between the biome and delirium. For example, in patients with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, they measured various cognitive scores, whether the patients had normal cognition or cognitive decline or amnestic mild impairment, and uh, they measured microbiome and uh, LPS and tight junction proteins on post-surgical days in people who were having orthopedic surgery, they did notice that there was a significant difference between the biome findings in patients with various cognition levels. So the, the idea was that perhaps uh, surgery does exacerbate whatever pre-existing conditions people have with regards to their microbiome imbalance. More relevant probably is uh, the study for post-operative delirium where they looked at the oncologic patients who had a mechanical bowel prep and they randomized whether patients would have a bowel prep or not. And patients who had a bowel prep had a significant decrease in biome diversity and significantly higher levels of delirium, odds ratio 4.8. So another study in patients with gastric cancer who were looked at uh, with regards to their biome Patients, they compared patients who did or did not have delirium, and patients with delirium had high levels of various bacteria that are usually not associated with healthy biome, like proteobacteria, 
Shigella, Klebsiella, the, the levels are very high, and the patients without delirium had uh, different bacteria. So the authors concluded that perhaps uh, uh, high levels of uh, Shigella would be predictive of having delirium. But the problem is everybody finds different findings. Another study of delirium in patients after cardiac surgery revealed that the people who had delirium had higher staphylococcus and pseudomonas counts. So they thought perhaps uh, those would be predictive of subsequent delirium. Changes actually persisted for a week later. And uh, recently, another study was just published where people had knee replacement procedure and uh, or laminectomy or hip replacement. And they also looked at people who had delirium and who didn't. And people with delirium had uh, specific uh, levels of bacteria that were elevated, and uh, they found a significant association between uh, pyrobacteroides. So the authors thought perhaps pyrobacteroides abundance could be predictive of delirium. A study that I couldn't find actually being published, but it was in Physicians Weekly, reported on 133 patients who they specifically looked to see what would be predictive of their delirium. And they excluded a whole lot of patients, such as uh, those with antibiotic use, recent probiotics, artificial nutrition, etc. And they looked at uh, delirium and they analyzed stool samples. So they found that in the participants who had delirium, the alpha diversity, Shannon diversity, which is how diverse your biome is, was uh, significantly reduced. And uh, greater diversity portended lower risk for delirium. And they found that enterobacter was associated with the pro-inflammatory states and with delirium. So the conclusion was that, yes, the gut composition is a relevant factor. What do you do with that? Right now, right, nothing. Uh, everybody is pretty much scared to do anything in the ICU setting other than try a few probiotic supplements that have very mixed results. And their results are as heterogeneous as supplements themselves. Uh, there were a couple of brave souls who did a fecal transplant to 90-year-old women uh, with refractory colitis and uh, delirium. And in both cases, people actually did well and they improved cognitively. But because of bacterial translocation, um, the, right now it's very troublesome to do this type of work. So in another trial, they looked at patients who had dementia, they were not ICU patients, and severe CDI. And uh, they did fecal transplant in 10 of them, and they compared the microbiome, and naturally people who had fecal transplantation had much better biome, and they had higher levels of the beneficial bacteria, such as proteobacteria and bacteroides. So the bottom line, a lot of unknown in this field, and uh, just keep in mind that diversity of microbiome is associated with health and longevity, and in critical illness, dysbiosis is very common. It may be an unrecognized factor for the high rates of psychiatric morbidity that we see in the survivors of critical illness. It's definitely beginning more and more recognized as a risk factor for delirium. And perhaps uh, there'll be more work going forward to explore the diversity of this field and to find the practical implementation of this knowledge. As it seems right now, every study is reporting their own thing and there's really very little homogeneity in data so far. So this is just an emerging field that I wanted to bring up to your attention. And uh, thank you so much. If, um, just a question in the front, if I just ask you to stand up so she can see you, please. Um, while we're waiting for the microphone, just over there, please. Sorry, over there, in the, in the front, in the front. Yeah, keep going. Um, so I often um, think that the gut is probably the most um, recognized organ in a crystal care patient, other than what nutrition we're going to get them and whether their bowel has moved. Um, so it's fascinating. But anyway, question. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. I promise to stop washing my hands and eat more and eat more green vegetables now. I think uh, it's very important. Um, I guess one really important, one really difficult thing is how do you distinguish between um, patients who are just sicker, and because they are sicker, they're more likely to get antibiotics and they're more likely to have organ dysfunction, and perhaps they're also more likely to get dysbiosis. And because they're sicker, they're also more likely to get 
delirium. How do you differentiate and how do you know, I mean, that's obviously association, that good dysbiosis is, is maybe a cause defector or maybe it's just a marker of how sick the patient is? Well, you need to conduct uh, real research and uh, control for severity of illness. So that research has not been done. Usually all of these are small single center studies. So maybe you would be the first person to do that research, to actually control for the things that you mention, that we can actually have something more definitive, whether it's a chicken or the egg or both. <laughs> Um, there's another question um, in the in the middle. Th thank you for your talk. I was just wondering if uh, there's any specific type of feeding that worsens dysbiosis or improves dysbiosis that we do in the ICU that we could change. Well, that's a whole separate topic. So when you hang a tube feed, perhaps look at the ingredients. Some of the tubes feeds will have high fructose corn syrup which is known to promote uh, triglyceride formation. It's very toxic for the gut, actually, even though in the United States you could be hard-pressed to find any food without it. But it's uh, known to cause bacterial translocation and dysbiosis. Another thing to watch out for is, uh, do you have, what kind of emulsifiers are there? Like carboxymethyl cellulose is a component of some of the tube feeds, and it's also pretty toxic for the gut, and it promotes gut inflammation. So, but, when the tube feeds were designed, microbiome was not an entity that anybody really thought about. So as we are learning, perhaps um, the tube feeds would be redesigned with that in mind. But right now, that data has not yet been examined in that population. But are there any commercially available without high fructose corn syrup? Yes, but I'm not supposed to talk about commercial entities here. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will bone broth. Bone broth. Wow. Bone broth. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's me. Okay. So I now get the distinct pleasure of, in, sorry, I get now get the distinct pleasure of introducing my co-moderator. Um, Joyce Young will be our next speaker, and she's going to talk with us about how anesthetic technique can influence delirium. I get to switch platforms. Um, so, yes, thank you very much, and uh, I really like the fact that um, anesthesia was mentioned as a modifier of, modifiable risk factor for delirium, so let's see how I get through this. Um, um, so, I don't have any real conflict of interest. Um, I did receive a fellowship funding from NIHR to do a feasibility study looking at delirium um, and, and the impact of anesthetic uh, technique, and I'm under the co-investigator of RAGA, which I will briefly mention. Um, so, uh, lovely setting a scene and talk about delirium, and I think, um, uh, obviously, in critical care, um, this is a real problem, and I would um, argue that in the post-surgical patients, um, this is equally important. Um, all the bad things that you see in delirious ITU patient basically happen in a surgical patient, and I think as critical care physician, we sometimes see the end result of this delirious patient who have um, what looks like acute brain failure um, as part and parcel of their, their acute illness, and they end up in in, in intensive care. So I think it is important to have a look to see uh, whether there is anything within anesthesia that we can do to minimize the risk and the harm to patients. Um, and uh, it's a really big topic, so I try to pick things that is interesting to me, hopefully interesting to you. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at the impact of surgery and how that um, predisposes people to have higher risk of, an, uh, of delirium. And then I'm also going to look at whether anesthesia make it better or worse. You can probably guess. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really a perfect storm. Um, the surgical stress response or your stress response of your body respond to the extent of your surgery. So the more severe surgery you can get, um, the more your body is going to respond. And in, in actual fact, um, the current theory is that it's your body's attempt to maintain hemostasis and maintain uh, the status quo that sometimes means that you, um, you have a dysregulation of uh, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory uh, markers that leads to um, sort of acute brain failure. Um, but in, in surgery, um, and in those patients who are older, who may already have pre-existing cognitive dysfunction, and those people who may have undiagnosed dementia, coming in for emergency surgery and following possibly trauma, these are the patients who are most likely to, to suffer from delirium. 
so yes, yeah, so inflammatory response, so uh, this is going back to medical school, um, uh, lots of things going on here, but mainly we want to have a look at um, sort of um, how the systemic and pro-inflammatory markers are, uh, are uh, uh, sort of provoke during the stress response. So obviously, if the patient coming in for cancer surgery, um, they would probably not have very good nutrition anyway, and they may already have infection, they've got emergency surgery. And the cytokines lead to a, a sort of sepsis SERS response. Um, and then obviously, infl um, inflammatory markers such as IL-6 has got a good link to delirium. And, and lo and behold, anesthesia, if you give someone some volatile anesthesia, certainly in the uh, cellular level or in the lab, we do know that volatile anesthesia uh, suppresses natural killer cells activity and also make your neutrophils less uh, functional. So um, you can already start to see if you've got a good mix of the inflammatory response to surgery and you mix in anesthesia uh, drugs, what might happen. Moving on to some neuroendocrine, lots of things happen to, in surgery. Um, you can see that um, you know, your sympathetic nervous system get ticked off, um, and obviously your pituitary, your hypothalamus all, all, all start to come, come on board, and this is made worse by anxiety, fasting again, uh, if you're older, if you're more frail. Um, and obviously um, in the catabolic syndrome, or, or the state of post-surgery as well. And what happens in, um, as a result is that you can, if you do measure cortisol um, of a patient post-surgery, you see that um, surgery disrupts your circadian system, disrupts your um, HPA access. Um, cortisol remained, uh, would rise within hours um, to different levels and it maintained elevated in uh, seven days. And what we find that if your cortisol level is uh, raised and maintained elevated, you're at much higher risk of um, um, uh, developing post delirium um, compared to those who um, cortisol don't rise that, that high and so gently leveled out, um, you're at low risk. Um, and then again, you know, all, all the things that you see in a surgical patient, it is going to uh, happen. And, um, and lo and behold, if you give someone a volatile anesthesia, um, you have more, it, the cortisol level rises higher than if you give someone propofol um, anesthesia, like an intravenous anesthesia. So again, we know that the way we give a general anesthesia will have an impact on the risk factors that patients have in developing post delirium. Right, so um, I think, hopefully, <laughs> you can see how anesthesia potentially worsens impact of surgery. Uh, all these things happen when you come into the hospital, you don't have enough sleep. Um, obviously, you know, in a hospital environment, you're already been fasted, you're probably dehydrated, um, electrolyte disturbances, you're in pain, you may be fighting over infection, you may be needing more oxygen if you've got a chest infection. And then the anesthesia with all the drugs that we give um, in order to get someone nicely off to sleep, what we currently do is um, create an imbalance or neurotransmitter release, um, such as GABA, anticholinergic, antihistamines, everything that we know is bad for a patient. In the critical care environment, we essentially would probably give that as part of a, a good general anesthetic. So what can we do? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's been quite a bit of work. Um, I think we are quite behind in terms of compared to other um, other areas of research, for example, ITU delirium. Um, this are, is our friendly mice again, uh, unfortunately. We're exposing them to, to anesthesia. So um, the, the, the diagram on your right is uh, three hours of anesthesia exposing to cefalofluorine, which we believe is probably one of the more gentle um, volatile anesthesia. But as you can see, um, uh, control. Uh, this is your blood brain barrier. Very tight junctions. Uh, no leakies, no holes. Um, on the right hand side, after three hours of volatile anesthesia, you can see these tight junctions are starting to come apart and um, you, you get little holes in your blood brain barrier. Um, probably means that you're more susceptible to pro inflammatory uh, cytokines, inflammatory markers, which might affect your, your brain and how it functions. So you can see almost immediate changes in your brain, vascular endothelial cells. Um, and yet again, our friend, our friend volatile anesthesia is the culprit here, um, and uh, we, which brings upon the hypothesis that perhaps if we avoid giving patients volatile anesthesia, perhaps we can reduce the risk of post delirium. So let's test it out. So this is a, a systematic review in Cochrane uh, by my friend um, up in Sheffield. And um, uh, this is actually not the graph or not the forest plot for delirium because they did not find a difference between those patients who are given volatile anesthesia to those given um, TIVA anesthetic with total intravenous anesthesia. So just a 
propofol base anesthesia. Uh, what they did find a, a difference, which is the first part I'm showing you here with the diamond favoring TIVA anesthesia, is cognitive dysfunction. Um, but it's low certainty um, evidence. Um, there is high risk of bias, heterogeneity, all the usual caveat of uh, perioperative studies. Um, and it is also a secondary outcome as well. So not quite as high power to detect a difference, but perhaps a signal that T anesthesia is better for your brain if you come into for surgery. Well, um, uh, there is some good news. Um, I think the way we give anesthesia may have an impact on postoperative delirium. Um, this is probably one of the very first studies and convincing study, which tells us that it may be by uh, improving the way, targeting the way we give general anesthesia, we may be able to reduce some of the immunomodulating effects. So not sure whether anyone recognized that graph, but it's from the post-operative delirium sub-study of the BALANCE trial. And so this is a trial that compare targeted BIS monitoring um, in patients, so light versus low um, BIS monitoring, and um, this is the incidence of delirium in the two groups. As you can see there, uh, by having pe uh, patients lightly sedated compared deeply sedated, they have a lower risk of uh, developing delirium. Um, it's worth knowing that um, BALANCE trial is a volatile-based study, so they did not have TIVA patients in this group. So this will suggest that perhaps it's not the drug that we give, but the way we give it, if we give a more targeted, measured way, we may be able to avoid harm doing to the patients. So significant low incidence of delirium, and also better cognitive function at one year um, after surgery. So um, really something that um, has uh, uh, simulated a lot of interest and debate uh, in the anesthesia community. Um, however, it is a sub-study, a balance trial. It was significant, um, but it wasn't their primary outcome when they first set out to do the balance study. Uh, what about regional techniques? So what if we avoid giving general anesthesia altogether? Um, so this is looking at the HPA response, cortisol, adrenaline, all that thing. So um, this is the study done in America um, by Mark Newman, uh, looking at uh, spinal versus general anesthesia in hip fracture patients in older adults. Hip fracture patients are selected because they are at higher risk of developing delirium um, because of the older age, uh, the existing cognitive dysfunction, and also the trauma. Um, so these patients are really at very high risk. So I think this group was picked for exactly that reason. Um, this is a rather large study, 1,600 patients. Um, and they managed to have a good separation of spinal and general anesthetic. Unfortunately, for their primary outcome, they did not find a difference between survival and recovery or embolation at 60 days. Um, delirium was a secondary outcome, um, and they also did not find a difference between these two groups, which was disappointing. Um, this is a second study that I'm in, involved with, the Raga trial. We attempted to do something uh, similar um, in China. So we were looking at delirium uh, in older patients um, slightly smaller study. Uh, it was, it, we, we did it about the same time. Um, that this is why they, they, they both came out um, similar times. Um, the two groups in the, in the spinal group this time, we had a, a good proportion of epidurals. Um, again, no sedation compared to general anesthesia. Um, we did not find a um, difference in incidence or severity of delirium in the first seven days. Um, however, you know, um, epidural is not commonly used in other countries for hip fracture patients, so there may be slightly lack of um, generalizability, and our cohort also have very low incidence of mortality, which is unusual, um, very low at uh, less than 2% in the trial. Okay, um, other things, so only, <laughs> there are many, many drugs you can give, but um, I'm gonna focus on things that are hopefully interesting. So, uh, interoperative steroids. Steroids reduce the impact of delirium. We heard a lot about steroids in, in this conference. Um, it has to be good for something. So this time we're looking at um, um, uh, delirium. Um, this is only a feasibility study, the stride study. Look at giving 20 milligrams of dexamethasone as soon as patient hit the um, hospital following hip fracture. Um, and they did find a significant difference in severity scores. Um, uh, but um, I, I as you see that they are a very small number of patients, so uh, larger trials needed. Um, they didn't find any uh, difference in the actual instance delirium, um, but, um, but they only have 40 patients in each group. Uh, Desmetoptomidine has already been uh, mentioned, um, so we can also use that in, in, as a package of giving total intravenous anesthesia. So again, um, it has been suggested that it lowered the risk of delirium, so there has been a couple of trials looking at this. 
the first one is a mix of cardiac and non-cardiac patients in a randomized placebo control trial. Um, again, quite a small study, um, but they did find a significant reduction in incidence of delirium. Um, but I, I would argue that this is uh, probably uh, a need a larger, more definitive trial. Um, there is a bit of a, a warning, though. So this is an, another uh, study that looked at um, similar, um, uh, similar uh, study designed to reduce delirium, and this is it only in cardiac patients. And they did not find a difference in delirium, but they did find it maybe uh, slightly uh, a signal of harm that these patients needed more noradrenaline and maybe also higher mortality. So uh, it, it may be good for some patients, but we currently don't know which one we should give it to. Right, so uh, I'm going to summarise now. Um, so palliative intervention, this is a, a nice uh, wheel representation of uh, bundles of care that we can do to reduce uh, risk of delirium post-surgery. As you can see, it's multimodal, some of them not non-pharmacological, uh, maybe gut health should be part of this wheel as well, um, but it does target modifiable risk factors, uh, but anesthesia is really only part of the puzzle. So in summary, um, in terms of how to use um, or how to modify your anesthesia to reduce the risk of delirium, I would say that those that have uh, evidence is target your depth of anesthesia. So use bismonitor or entropy to make sure you're giving the right dose to the patient. Uh, regional anesthesia or regional analgesic techniques are still good um, because it reduces and minimizes the use of opioids. So although we haven't proven it, in theory and principle, it is still a very good anesthetic to use. Um, these are uncertainties. There's no clear data on any specific drugs at all. Uh, potentially, I think a risk-based personalised approach would be really good. Um, there is a big question mark about total intravenous anaesthesia, and hopefully there will be more um, research in the future to help us answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. Are there any questions from the audience? If you have a question, please do stand up. I know it's hard to see in this room. Um, in the meantime, I'll take, I guess, the prerogative to ask you a question. So I am, uh, the disclosure is I am not an anesthetist, so um, this is all news to me. Um, but I do hear of some randomized control trials underway, at least in the States, and I think they've been completed here in, in Europe, of the use of volatile anesthetics in the ICU setting. And so it's interesting to me to then hear how when you're thinking about it, you're thinking about moving away from that potentially to, to intravenous anesthesia. And so I'm curious, um, do we think that some of these concerns may transfer to the ICU setting? Does that make you nervous that people are looking into potentially doing that? Um, you know, um, so, so anecdotally, we've also used volatile anesthesia in, in ITU for those who are difficult to ventilate or don't tolerate um, uh, sedation. Um, but uh, I think we're still... Uh, for those patients, I think there is a specific reason why we're using volatile anesthesia, either ventilation problems or station problems. So I think they might still be the minority. Um, I have to declare a conflict of interest that I'm running a randomized controlled trial of volatile versus t anesthesia and major non-cardiac surgery, looking at a whole host of patient outcomes. Um, I think there's a risk there. Um, the risk is that because we are concerned about the environment, um, you may be aware that uh, a lot of anesthetists are moving away from volatile anesthesia onto total sheet total intravenous anesthesia um, because of environmental concerns and because there's some observational data that shows cancer patients survive for longer if they have TV anesthesia versus volatile. Um, that's not really been proven. Um, and uh, the change in the practice in UK went from eight, uh, less than 8% to 26% of people are now using TV anesthesia. And the reason why we want to do more research, or in my case, a trial, is that we don't know whether we're exposing patients to unknown harms by changing our practice wholesale. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you're right. I think um, uh, because the anesthetic has the same effect but works so differently, I think there needs to be more research before we know. Fair enough. I think we have a question in the front. Yep. Thank you. A, a fantastic. Um, so BIS guided monitoring also showed in, in a Cochrane review recently that it reduces post-operative delirium. So first question is, how do we get anaesthetists to actually use it? Um, and the second question is, do you think there's a role for BIS in ICU to monitor, um, you know, sedation and, um, and by doing so reduce delirium? Yeah. Um, I think um, I am an anaesthetist, so I can say this. Um, <laughs> Um, we, we believe that our technique is, uh, is best and correct, um, and that includes the use of uh, base monitor or not. Um, and I think um, 
uh, I think the, the use in other countries are slightly better. Certainly in the UK, it is a minority. Um, it's only recommended by our uh, organisation, NICE, in those patients at high risk of being to suffer accidental awareness. Um, so their use is to try to prevent accidental awareness rather than prevent harm, uh, other harms that we know of. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting. Um, it's difficult because uh, some, some of my colleagues will believe it's a random number generator. Um, so it's, it's almost like if, if we have found that um, result, so how do we implement it? Um, and I think it needs, um, we, I think we need to um, approach it as if it's, it's a complex intervention. We need to understand why people are not going to use a uh, base monitor, what the concerns are, and actually work with them to make sure that they do take on board. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think it's going to take time. Um, we're probably a little bit stubborn. Can say that because I'm one of them. There's another question that, at the back there. I don't know whether you can see. Uh, Thanks for your talk. Um, again, I, I might have got this wrong, but uh, you said in the Regain trial uh, there was no difference in the incidence of delirium between patients who got regional anaesthesia versus those who got a general anaesthesia, and I'm taking it uh, they got inhalational anaesthetic there. Whereas when you compare TIVA with inhalational, uh, you have a higher instance of delirium in patients of that an inhalational anaesthetic. How would you explain that difference? Uh, they, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not read the papers, so right. I, I Sorry. Don't know the details. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um, so my understanding is uh, both Regain and Raga trial are volatile based anaesthesia. So we did not uh, randomise patients to TIVA anaesthesia. So they're all volatile anaesthesia, general anaesthesia, or spinal anaesthesia. Um, so they did not find a difference between volatile-based general anaesthesia and spinal anaesthesia in terms of general anaesthetic. Um, there is a, in a Cochrane review, there is a, some evidence that T anaesthesia uh, may uh, improve cognitive dysfunction, but not delirium. It's probably a, an outcome measure problem. That's but thank, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, you Dr. Young. And while Dr. Young walks back over here, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Ronaldo Bolomo. He's going to be speaking with us about natural language processing um, and whether we can help to characterize it. And I just want to uh, assure everyone, I know it looks like we're running a bit over. We are actually missing one speaker at the end, so we're going to finish nice and on time, but just allowing opportunity for more questions. No Dr. Bolomo. That's fine. That's all good. Thank you very much. You know, we taken a very different kind of approach to all of this and that's been going on for several years now and uh, we try to reflect about what delirium is and whether it's actually a useful concept and I know that is disturbing probably to most of you and it might make you delirious but that's what we've done. We've reflected that the way we think about delirium requires that the observer should see that the patient has a behavioral disturbance because we can never know the cognition of a human being. You don't know what I'm thinking now that you can't know it. But if I started jumping, jumping up and down here, uh, you would say my behavior is disturbed. And in uh, the intensive care, you can identify there's disturbed behavior because it's either visible, the patient is ripping the central line and extubating uh, and punching the doctor or the nurse or because you've elicited some abnormal behavior, like you've asked them to do something and you've asked them to say something and it's abnormal what they say. So it can be physical or verbal and we can only recognize it by observation. There's no gold standard for delirium. And unlike all the physical things that we see in intensive care, but very much like all the psychiatric things that psychiatrists deal with, the diagnosis of delirium appears to be a property of the patient, but also a property of the observer. So how do observers diagnose delirium? Well, they do it by doing a blood test? No. They do an EEG? No. They do a CT scan? No. They do an MRI? No. No, they don't. They don't. They interact with the patient, they look at the patient, and then they report what they see. And the only way that we report that is by words. There are no numbers around the diagnosis of delirium. There is no delirium in level. Uh, they can be measured. There are only words that describe it. And so the words describe all of this and provide a unique opportunity to try and understand disturbed behavior. In order to do that, you first need to develop a lexicon of what 
doctors and nurses might use to identify patients that they think have got disturbed behavior. And you can give them a, a, a group of words, some of them to try to confuse them and trick them, and some words that you think are probably real, and then you see how many times on the Likert scale they think it's likely, very likely, this word would describe delirium. You can select words the score four or above, and you can use them then to study what people say in their notes when they describe what's going on in patients uh, and how they describe abnormal behavior. You can do that now with uh, IT, right? You can actually read lots of words very, very quickly with computers. You can get the computer to go into all the EMR notes by the doctors, the physiotherapists, and the nurses. And then you get the computer to run during the night while you're having a good sleep. And when you wake up in the morning, you have an answer. And you can use these words to identify people that have a condition that we've decided to call natural language processing, NLP, diagnosed behavioral disturbance. We don't want to call it delirium. We don't know what it is. It's a thing. It's what nurses, doctors, and physiotherapists say about the patient. And when we looked at a, a significant group of patients in our ICU, where there is also the usual assessment with a screening tool, not a diagnostics tool, with diagnostic tool, CAM ICU. And then you've got different groups of people. You can see that there are people that are CAM ICU negative, but natural language uh, processing positive. There's quite a few of them. And there are people that are positive with CAM-ICU, but negative for natural language processing. Very, very few. That tells you this is a very sensitive tool in relation to CAM-ICU, but less specific. So what are the characteristics of these patients that we've identified by natural language processing as having abnormal behavior? Well, they're sicker, they're older, they're more likely to be emergencies, they're more likely to have respiratory failure. They're actually sick people. Nice, so that makes sense. Sick people tend to have more disturbed behavior. They're more likely to be on vasopressors, they're more likely to be ventilated, they've got bad gas exchange, they've got a lower urinary output, they've got a higher lactate. Nice. So we're not picking up people that are sitting there having a cigarette watching television. We're actually picking up people that appear to be particularly sick in the ICU. If this kind of pickup technology for people that we think are more relevant to ICU was really useful, you might expect that these patients will be more likely to get antipsychotic medications. Golly gosh, it's true. These people that nurses and doctors describe as having abnormal behavior, as you would expect, are more likely to get antipsychotic medications. And the antipsychotic medications are usually given early in the first two to three or four days. And if you're both CAM ICU positive on screening and natural language positive, you're most likely to get these medications. That sounds all very plausible, clinically relevant, and really nice. And you might expect that if you've got all these things going on in your mind and in your behavior, if you're a naughty patient, then you'll be more likely to be ventilated for longer. Yes, stay in ICU for longer. Yes, stay in hospital for longer. Yes, and be more likely to die. Yes. And you adjust all of this for all the baseline characteristics, the predict outcome, and being natural language processing positive for behavioral disturbance is yet another marker of illness severity and poor outcome. And as I said before, it's a very powerful predictor and association with the use of antipsychotic medications. So that's nice. Um, the next question that we've asked is, can you use words to identify subtypes or behavior? that are relevant potentially to medications and management of these patients. So now we've gone one step further. We now try to subdivide the words that people use to describe these patients into words that describe agitation and words that do not describe agitation but describe a confused, disorientated state of mind. So 
we looked at about 80,000 clinical notes <clears throat> and about 70, 17 million words. You had to let the computer run for a while to do this. And this is the lexicon that we created by asking clinicians about what describes hyperactive or agitated behavior, hyperactive uh, behavior. And of course, we have to put the negation words because somebody could write in the notes, not agitated, and then you might think that person is actually agitated. So this is uh, a word cloud that describes which words are most commonly used. And of course, for agitation, the most commonly used words are agitation and agitated. That's not, not a surprise. And when you move out to the people that are not having agitated behavior being described, then you have other words to describe that things aren't quite right. And the nurses and the doctors might say, the patient is confused, they've got a fluctuating conscious state, they're disorientated, they're delirious. So two different kind of libraries, if you, if you wish to describe them. And of course, these patients are different. And so the patients that are agitated are younger, they're less severely ill, uh, they're likely to be admitted after a medical emergency team call, and more likely to be emergency department admissions. They're more, more often ventilated than the non-agitated patients. You've got to keep them calm. Uh, you've got to control them. They've got lower creatinine level, higher mean arterial pressure. They're less likely to be febrile. So they represent a different population. So what about people that have got a mixed picture that's combined agitation on a given shift? There's agitation and confusion and disorientation. So you can identify these three different groups where you've got hyperactive or agitated, hyperactive, not agitated, and mixed. And you can see as time goes by, people start fluctuating into the two different sets of behavioral state. Another way to represent that is to do a Sankey diagram, and you can see how people move, for example, from an agitated state to a combined state. Some of them go this direction, some of them become non-agitated, and some of them resolve, and so on. So there's a transition of patients in the first 48 hours from state to another. So this allows us not only to describe the phenotype uh, that the words try to capture, uh, but also describes the way it moves across from one condition to another, which tells you that phenotyping is a dynamic state and there are trajectories in the phenotype that people express. And, of course, you see that agitation is associated with a greater risk of receiving antipsychotic medications, whether it is isolated or whether it is combined with a non-agitated set of words. And if you do multivariable logistic regression analysis adjusting for uh, a variety of characteristics, the use of ventilation and considering the phenotypes as time variant uh, characteristics, again, you start seeing that agitation is what drives clinician behavior in terms of prescription of medications. And uh, if you compare those characteristics, not to each other, but for example, to patients that don't have a disturbance, you can see that if you have agitation or you have a combined state, which of course includes agitation, there's a massive increase in your odds ratio of receiving antipsychotic medications. And you can look at time in ICU, hospital length of stay, mortality, and all of those are associated with these uh, diagnosis. And uh, you might see there that if you have a combined state, you're more likely to do well, but in fact there is a trickery around that because to get two diagnoses of behavioral disturbance over time, you've got to be alive for a short, for a longer period of time. And even do, doing statistics to adjust for that does really quite capture that. So let me conclude by saying that natural language processing is a, an IT technique they can be used to characterize behavioral disturbance in ICU patients. Uh, this kind of behavioral disturbance offers another model, not the right one, just another model, to uh, understand abnormal cognitive and behavioral states. And it's a model that makes no assumptions, just describes. And this model identifies the importance of agitation in the behavior of clinicians 
in relation to the use of antipsychotic medications, and I'm sure this came to, comes to you with no surprise. And as such, it may be a more useful concept, right? Because it describes something that leads to actions. And it may be a particularly useful concept for the conduct of randomized controlled trials of intervention in the ICU. It may be isolated or may be combined, but all of this modeling and all of this thinking allows an understanding of the dynamic nature and the trajectory of this kind of behavior. It may well be that focusing on words and focusing on behavior is a more useful epidemiological concept for our understanding of what goes on, but also for the conduct of randomized controlled trials. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for part one, Dr. Bellomo. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, if you don't mind, can you please stand up? I know it's hard. Oh, she's right behind you to see from her perspective. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you tell us if the new diagnosis that you're proposing, is it a continuous variable or is it just yes or no? So it's a complex answer, in fact, you know, because you're looking at all of the words that are being used, right? Uh, and it's being, it's being assessed every shift. So you look at every shift. So in our system, a shift is eight hours. So every eight hours, you look at the words and what words appear. And then depending on whether, if you've selected the lexicon that describes agitation or the word agitated, combative, aggressive, all sorts of words, uh, restrained, uh, f abusive, all those things, then you get classified into the agitated state. If you had other words that people believe do not describe an agitated state, like delirious, confused, disoriented, uh, fluctuating, then you get classified there. If none of these words appear, then you get classified as being normal. But uh, for the variability, as in like uh, people kind of diabolically decided that the patient <coughs> is agitated and actually not writing it down. Oh, we can't. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's uh, quite likely that in a variety of circumstances, the notes are incorrect. But think about this. The alternative technology that we use to deal with the diagnosis of this thing, this nebulous, hazy, cognitive disorientation, psychiatric symptom or syndrome, is to do diagnostic screening once a shift or once a day or twice a day with CAMICU. Contrast that with a nurse at the bedside for eight hours and giving a summary <clears throat> of her interaction with the patient. Which one do you think is closest to what's really going on at the cold face? The minor brrr at the cold face or somebody in an office checking, hey, is the cold face a hard to drill? Eh, it's okay. Which one? Think about it. Thanks, Ronaldo. Um, I'd like to challenge the um, the hyperactive phenotype in, in your processing tool, um, and I think I, I should, we should call it subtypes. I think the phenotypes are the yes. ones, the hypoxic, and sure. the, so these are the little Sounds subtypes. Enough, I think yeah. I looked at the, uh, the words that you used to describe it, but there weren't many u words that really describe hypoactive delirium, and it's of course very difficult to recognize and, 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 and diagnose, but things like uh, uh, you know, lethargic or stupor or difficult to rouse, those sorts of things. So I think your tool probably, like, like every tool, like MIC, will under-recognize and under-diagnose hypoactive delirium. I don't know whether that matters, but that, that's probably... So, so th absolutely, absolutely. And I think you're 100% right. But now let me come back to you with another thing. Who cares? Right? So if a patient is disorientated, what have I got to offer them that will reorientate them? If there is a medication or an intervention that can be demonstrated, as far as I know, I've never seen one, to take somebody that's got neurocognitive dysfunction acutely in the setting of critical illness and reorientate them by being given or shown to them or whatever it is, I want to be on it. 
I've never seen it. I'll make sure you will. Um, just one other quick question. Um, how can this help real time? Because right now, of course, in, in your research setting, it's retrospective and you need to run the That's computer right. overnight. And the CAM ICU, we have it, and we can just say yes or no. So you can automate the involvement of patients into trials by actually setting out the computer system and the IT system. So as soon as somebody, so it's not going to be real time, but it won't be too bad. Uh, as soon as agitate, then you go and randomize. My view is that uh, that is a much more useful construct for future randomized controlled trials because as I'm about to show you, the drugs that we have only deal with psychomotor agitation. They do not achieve neurocognitive resetting. As I said, if there was a drug that delivers neurocognitive resetting, I'll be popping it like there is no tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, seeing no additional hands raised and recognizing we'll have another opportunity to pepper Dr. Belomo with questions in about 15 minutes, um, we will now get on to hit part two of your lecture series um, on are antipsychotic drugs bad? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's another kind of controversial area, right? Um, some of the controversy was actually driven by this paper, which is an Australian paper, uh, in a very different setting. This is a hospice palliative care setting uh, in patients that were randomized to receive risperidone, haloperidol, or placebo. It's a nice, nice trial, very, very nice in a situation where there is a temptation to give these patients all these wonderful drugs so they don't disturb the nurses or the doctors or their neighbors. So what they reported was that uh, there was a difference uh, in terms of time to death in, in a hospice palliative care situation, which, by the way, may be a desirable outcome, but we will not discuss that for the time being. Uh, if you gave haloperidol, you were more likely to die earlier, uh, and that may not come as a surprise because of the side effects of haloperidol, but nonetheless, I got people very upset about the concept that, you know, the antipsychotic drugs are potentially a bad thing to give. But of course, you could argue that an ICU is like a hospice and there's a lot of palliative care in ICU. Nonetheless, we need to look at ICU separately. And this is the Danish trial, just recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, comparing haloperidol to placebo for the treatment of delirium. It's a large trial, well conducted. Patients were properly randomized and uh, it allowed us to obtain a very substantive understanding of delirium and its treatment and what might be going on when you use an antipsychotic medication like haloperidol for it. So the first thing, again, since we've just discussed uh, all of these things, uh, they got subtyped. Frank, they use the word subtype. Good, isn't it? Uh, they were subtyped at randomization. You can see that half of the patients were hyperactive and half of the patients were hypoactive. So, in my opinion, immediately I would think, well, what are you going to do about the hypoactive people? Why would you give them haloperidol? Seems I wouldn't do it, but hey, what can you do? Uh, and let's see what happens. So, the duration of intervention is about three days. Uh, these are the doses, very, very similar. Uh, use of rescue medication is very similar. Propofol, alpha-2 agonists, benzodiazepines, uh, open labels, antipsychotic agents, restraints. There really was no difference in the process of care between those two, so indistinguishable. And the primary outcome was days alive and out of hospital at day 90, and there was no significant difference. Uh, and of course, it is uh, uh, kind of a requirement of the New England Journal of Medicine, you are not allowed to have any other P value except for the primary outcome. Uh, however, you might notice that there is this thing about mortality, and of course, in the supplement, uh, the Danish guys couldn't resist to put that in, and of course I would have done the same because everyone likes Kaplan-Meier right? And so you can see that the patients that were randomized to haloperidol had a significant difference in the time to survival compared to those who were randomized to placebo, making it unlikely that haloperidol is a particular evil drug to give to people that are delirious. And this is a forest plot of this study, and you can see that there is no difference in any of the subgroups, but you can also see that everything is shifted in the direction of haloperidol being better, which is not a proof of anything, but it's reassuring. Uh, 
So have people given haloperidol in the past? Well, Wes uh, has gone to another meeting or another presentation, but he did this quite a long time. It's now 10 years ago. This is a smaller study. Of course, those days, uh, large studies were not possible as they are now. Again, patients randomized uh, to either haloperidol or, or placebo. There's only 70 patients on each side. And you can see that for a variety of outcomes related to delirium, uh, there really was no difference between placebo and haloperidol, confirming the findings uh, of uh, the Danish study. And when you're looking at proportion alive and delirium free, again, there's no difference, confirming the previous studies. Were there more uh, side effects? It doesn't look like it. Uh, there was very similar profile to placebo. But again, uh, there is a little caveat to this, a deep in the study results, and that is when you look at patients that were agitated, the proportion that had a degree of persistent agitation was significantly less with haloperidol, uh, suggesting that as you would know as a clinician that if you're agitated, haloperidol is a treatment that will decrease psychomotor agitation, whilst placebo is unlikely to be as successful. What about comparing haloperidol with this, this prazodone? Again, that's uh, Wes Group at Vanderbilt, and this is a randomized controlled trial, and this is quite uh, substantial, and it's so three different arms, and uh, you can see placebo, haloperidol, cisprazidone, uh, and you can see the characteristics of the patients, and you can see the subtypes, and I put an arrow there because 90% of these patients were hypoactive. Well, there you have it then. Uh, as I argued before, I don't think you're going to get anything out of this. And of course, you didn't get anything out of this. There was no difference between placebo and the other two drugs uh, in terms of days alive without delirium, days with delirium, and days with coma. And there's no difference in the probability of survival. What about other drugs like quetiapine? Uh, this is all that we have that's randomized and placebo controlled. It's very small, it's by John Devlin, and it's only 36 patients. Uh, and this was uh, 50 milligrams titrated up versus placebo titrated up. Uh, the patients were reasonably well balanced as you can have them in a, such a small study. And when you look at the proportion of patients with delirium diagnosed by the usual screening tools, and of course, you've just heard me say all the things that I've just said about what delirium is or isn't, but nonetheless, if you take that at face value, there was a statistical difference in favor of giving quetiapine. And uh, the time of delirium was also different in favor of quetiapine. Uh, what about preventing delirium? as opposed to treating it with drugs. So this is the reduced randomized controlled trial giving haloperidol prophylaxis, either one milligram eight hourly or two, two milligrams eight hourly or placebo eight hourly, and a pretty substantial trial, nicely randomized control. And you can see that there was no difference in terms of survival analysis between the groups. Uh, and when you're looking at the incidence of delirium, delirium-free and coma-free days and so on and so forth, there was no difference between the haloperidol and the, um, and the two different doses and placebo. So it doesn't look like haloperidol is going to be an effective thing to stop people from becoming delirious. Unless you give it a low dose and continuously and you are in China. Uh, and this is a study in uh, intensive care units to large tertiary hospitals, quite substantive. The elderly patients are admitted to the intensive care unit, but this time they're getting a sort of bolus injection, and then they've got a continuous administration for the next 12 hours to prevent delirium. And if you look at that, uh, you, depending on the kind of surgery, it's intra-abdominal or other surgery, all surgery, there is a pattern there of the incidence of delirium being decreased. Uh, the daily prevalence of delirium being decreased, again, all assessed with the usual screening tools with all of their limitations in my mind, but nonetheless, uh, this was placebo control randomized, so whatever the tools may or may not be accurate for, uh, they are not going to be uh, biased and there's going to be internally consistent, internal validity. So it looks like uh, in this setting, 
giving a low dose infusion of haloperidol for 12 hours may be effective in preventing delirium. So what do clinicians do in light of all of this ocean of information which I have just shown you doesn't really show anything particularly dramatically good? Where well, they give them like there's no tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so the, in fact, hospitals, and this is uh, Vanderbilt again, are drug dealers and they're antipsychotic drug dealers. And that's uh, either they're all crazy or it's all quite reasonable and the evidence hasn't really caught up with the reality of it. And you can see the number of patients receiving antipsychotic medications uh, when they're used and all the characteristics of treatment in these patients. And we're talking about thousands of patients being exposed to haloperidol, olanzapine, haloperidol, quetiapine. It, it's, it's, it's a super drugs, which reflects very much what goes on in my ICU. Uh, and that's not taking into account the nurses and the doctors. So what about patients that come to the emergency department, the people that the, I, that the emergency department doctors call mad, bad, and sad? Uh, we use these drugs there as well. This is a randomized controlled trial, and this time we're using either droperidor or lanzapine to settle them. Most of them are on amphetamines or cocaine, and they come into the ED in a state of psychomotor agitation. And these drugs are reasonably effective. Uh, you can give intravenous olanzapine. There is an IV preparation. You can give it intramuscularly. You can give it troperidol. And it's more effective in getting the patient settled and calmed down and less psychomotor agitated than uh, the control group with placebo. Uh, and the additional use of other parental medications, midazolam and so on, is decreased. The number of adverse events is not increased. And it's an effective way of maximizing your ability to calm them down. So let me conclude by saying that antipsychotic medications are clearly widely prescribed in critical ill patients at risk of or with delirium, especially in the presence of agitation. The use appears reasonably safe. Uh, haloperidol has been studied in several trials with complex findings, but no evidence of harm. Uh, giving antipsychotic medication to patients with delirium without agitation seems unlikely to be particularly helpful, but nonetheless, it might happen. Uh, giving drugs, especially like haloperidol, to agitated delirium may be rational and useful and potentially effective and reasonably safe. Uh, there is a bit of stuff about quetiapine or lanzapine. However, it's likely they've got similar effects. Uh, and the data available suggests that giving antipsychotic meditation, uh, medication to vegetate delirium is rational, safe, and probably to a degree effective. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Bolomo. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, while people are thinking of their questions, I will ask you mine. So I get the sense from your conclusions and from some of your previous statements that, that this might be a nice setup for sort of personalized or stratified studies that might look at hypoactive in an easy setting, hypoactive versus hyperactive. But as I think about that, I wonder from your last talk about the idea that there are these combined picture patients, understandably that they may not be exactly hypoactive, but agitated or not at different periods. And so does that create challenges then for us thinking about subgrouping patients and, and sort of um, trial enrichment? And how might we go about rectifying those two things so that we study the right patient population and the right drug together? You know, the combined patients that receive these medications, in my opinion, I can't prove it because, you know, they're mixed together, get the medications because there is the agitation component, not because there is hypoactive component. Because if you've got an old lady that doesn't know where she is and doesn't know why she had an operation and doesn't know what's going on and is staring at the clock and is a little bit scared but it doesn't bother anyone, most people wouldn't do that much to her, but if there's a 22-year-old man trying to rip the endotracheal tube off and do crazy stuff, they would. And I think these are the drivers. Um, so the combined group still will be driven by agitation. I think the target is, with the drugs that we have, maybe one day we'll have something better, that that's the target. That's the population you want to have if you want to have a rational, randomized controlled trial of antipsychotic medications, whatever they might be. So you have to select a patient. Because even with the Danish study, half of the patients were hypoactive. And I 
don't think you can really make a difference in that population. So you, you have this, um, you know, you're mixing two groups of people and, and makes your ability to detect an effect much less. May I ask one follow-up to sure. it as I'm looking around? Yeah. So my a sense is that people's trajectory, they may have episodes of hyperactive and episodes of hypoactive. So would you then be advocating for um, recurrently screening them and enrolling them at, in a trial, for instance, directed at hyperactive activity at the time that they meet hyperactivity? Or one says, hey, look, they're mixed. I shouldn't include them at all. No, no. I, as soon as the word agitation appears, you you're, you're, you're my guy. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, you, you, I don't want you to be agitated. It's dangerous. Dangerous to the patient. It's dangerous to the staff. And it can be treated reasonably effectively. And as I've just shown you, probably safely. safely. And so you'd have to ask yourself, why wouldn't you do it? And then you could do the trials because, you know, if then they become less agitated, you know, you titrate the drug as necessary until, say, you've got a period of 24 hours or 48 hours when they're not agitated anymore and the indication is finished, then that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, all right. Seeing no further questions, uh, thank you again. Thank you. So we have our last speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Kofis from Poland, um, who's going to tell us why delirium is no longer an issue and we can all go home, I believe. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, such an audience um, so late on the afternoon. Um, on Friday, very impressive. We hope that delirium might be a lesser issue in the future, not that it will disappear. I have no conflict of interest regarding this particular talk. Um, the, the talk is based around a perspective that we have been invited to write for critical care, um, titled and a little bit challenging that the future of intensive care would be without delirium. Um, so we... Um, would like to deliver the message that when we follow the um, publications and if we follow the guidelines um, by overcoming sedation challenges, that maybe less and less patients will be delirious by atrogenic causes. Um, as um, Professor Balama has said, no pharmacological intervention and, uh, has been shown to either prevent delirium or be um, fully effective across the range of patients. And there is no superiority of one agent over another. But we know that benzodiazepines should be avoided. And also that there is a large heterogeneity between the groups with um, um, the information that the older populations, uh, older than 65 years of age, will be different than the younger populations including um, the side effects. What we really think will be um, improvement um, would be consistent implementation of the A to F bundle with all its elements uh, improved. That will um, lead to improved outcome and more delirium-free days. There have been studies showing that already. Um, but the literature is that, that the use of, the, of structured bundle care is not consistent across um, different settings across the world. So we are really much behind there. Um, so this is the traditional bundle that has been developed and endorsed by the Critical uh, Care Medicine Society. And we proposed that maybe by expanding that and adding three additional elements to the a, from A to F and expanding it as G, gaining insight into patient needs, and H, holistic and personalized approach, and maybe thinking about ICU design, we might um, turn the tables and um, make the environment um, so the, the world for the patients in the ICU a little bit different. Of course, nothing changes. The fact that um, we should deliver patient and um, family-centered care, um, that uh, the open ICU um, idea should be provided to all patients in the ICU, which is not um, across the world. We know that ma majority of the ICUs have got restricted visitation policies. Um, some some um, places it is only two hours per um, per day due to organisational reasons, 
Um, but maybe if we um, introduce a more hotel-like environment to the to the ICU, separating the strictly medical and the hotel site for the uh, patient uh, family um, and uh, the visitors, the relatives, then maybe it will um, introduce more um, home-like feeling to that um, horrible um, experience that patients have uh, in the ICU. But that needs structured communication, that needs structured um, educational pro pro programs, and the guidance from the, not just the nurses, but ourselves um, as physicians to, um, to the families. So humanizing intensive care has been uh, a concept um, for long liberation from, uh, from um, ICU as well. And this is a study um, that has looked at multidisciplinary team um, implement, uh, implementing the open visitation uh, policy to the ICU and is assessing um, interventions where relatives have been um, introduced to the picture. And it has been shown that it was better for decision making and it was better for family satisfaction. So what um, the nurse led um, interventions rely on um, sort of storytelling and diaries, I see diaries and um, nurse driven emotional support because as has already been said, um, the nurses are those at the bedside um, constantly. So they have the highest um, knowledge of the patient needs at the moment, at the current moment, but also they provide the support um, to, the, um, to the patient, the psychological support ongoing uh, and the family as, as well. So gaining insight, the GE element that we um, propose to add is um, just to acknowledge the preferences, uh, habits at home and pre-morbid pre lifestyle to um, introduce it to the, to the space in which the bedside at which the patient is residing. Um, that might be visual stimulus, that might be um, used therapeutic music of choice um, and um, other devices. The age um, follows that, holistic and, and personalized care, still based on patient preference. And um, with the sedation trials for the future, um, it will be, one element will be how to stratify the group and how to um, uh, define populations that will be studied, but also um, to add some elements of um, non-pharmacological interventions to sedation like virtual reality, music therapy or um, distraction. Now, moving on, the I is the ICU design. So that would be um, not only an architectural challenge, but also an environmental um, shift in thinking um, about the ICU organization. Um, introducing recognizable things for co home, but not making the environment too um, over overwhelming. And this is um, one of the um, co-authors uh, of this paper was Irene uh, van den Zaal from, um, from the Netherlands. And they have, um, this was one of the first studies that has shown that um, the intervention aimed at um, optimizing uh, the ICU environment can actually cause an effect of um, delirium and the incidence of delirium um, in, that, um, in that study was similar uh, across the patients, but after adjusting for co uh, confounders, the number of days with delirium decreased. And that was just by redesigning, opening the space um, from dark, small, open spaces to individual rooms. And um, this editorial has um, been the base for our um, discussion within that perspective. Um, how would intensive medicine in intensive care uh, medicine look like in 2050. The three authors of this paper initiated it, saying that in 2050 they probably won't be around. But what they would like to see is a hospital, definitely um, smaller than in the past, with lots of ICU beds, but very few other beds, interestingly, that we will deliver the majority of the, of the care. And it looks like a five-star hotel rather than a hospital with nice shops and restaurants in the lobby makes you forget you're in a hospital. So that element of um, um, home-like environment or not very um, horrid uh, environment is important. My IC room is fantastic, really spacious with comfortable sofa for my family who can visit me anytime, a very important element that, that comes across different studies. 
On the wall, there's an enormous screen which replaces all the small, noisy monitors I remember seeing in the photos of my dad of his way back 40 years ago. So something that is quiet, non-disturbing, um, is um, important. So we have, in that paper, we asked um, an architect and um, a graphic designer to help us um, design that um, ICU of the, of the future that could possibly um, help us rethink or redirect our thinking. And um, if that's possible, we would like to separate or show um, the future designers that the, ho uh, the hotel part could be separated from the medical corridor and that the um, beds could be easily orientated towards the window with the new design, that um, there should be support for sensors at the bedside and contact with the nature, if possible, with um, a, flow, a flow of fresh air and something visually attractive um, out of the window. Uh, and obviously many people would say it's not, it's not possible to do that immediately in every ICU. Obviously, that's the case, but we're talking about future designs. The idea of neuroaesthetics that we have also um, looked at was to um, use art therapy to improve mental health conditions and introduce that to the space. There has been studies during COVID-19 that has shown that visual aesthetics, visual aesthetics can influence neuronal activity um, just associated with the reward system and, and stimulating the visual areas of the brain. So something that we haven't really thought about maybe um, because the ICU environment was so hostile, it had to be sterile, very easily um, cleanable. Um, now this all can be um, introduced with some, um, some attractive ideas. Natural light in the ICU with beds oriented towards the window. This is uh, a simple intervention from our ICU, from my ICU where I work. We, just by moving the window um, 90 degrees um, changes a lot of the view for the patient and it um, is an easy intervention. Now the room itself, um, the high-tech um, um, equipment should be separated from the direct uh, patient bedside. Um, acoustical isolation should um, be allowed to allow for noise control. Um, early mobility uh, could be facilitated with uh, equipment built into the bed and um, a panel ceiling that could work as an um, e-window if, if that's necessary to, um, uh, to make the changes throughout the um, circadian rhythm um, and adjust day and night um, accordingly. And um, also contact with the nature um, is a concept that might be um, introduced. Now the efficacy of few windows for prevention of delirium will uh, is being studied, uh, but the results of that analysis, uh, meta-analysis, have not been um, published yet. And um, just to, to make sure that we're not the only ones thinking about the ICU environment and how to modify it in terms of minimizing noise and um, optimizing light, uh, but also opening the the space to, to light during the day and shutting it to, um, to, towards the night. We um, would like, we, we, in, in the previous paper, we looked at future um, directions and knowledge gaps that would be an agenda for the next 10 years of research. And obviously, uh, one of those is um, adding new equipment to um, delirium diagnosis. And one of those is what um, Professor Balomo has has brought into the um, discussion, um, but also mastering delirium pathophysiology as we know not enough. We know we have some information, but we don't know enough. Um, new phenotyping models, because now we have got, no, we haven't got, we don't know enough pathophysiologically, and that's why the group that we study is so heterogeneous. Um, delirium biomarkers and predictive models, there are no biomarkers available that are reliable at the moment. And um, the pathophysiology is so um, robust and complicated, and it also is heterogeneic across different patient populations, either hyper-hyper um, uh, active or looking at the, at the causes um, of delirium, that these populations are really not yet fully comparable. Now, um, the um, causes for delirium as um, there will be differences um, in the outcome for those who are 
hypoxic, um, and that's hypoxic-driven um, delirium as opposed to those septic with ongoing cytokine um, um, release. Future monitoring um, technologies could be of use if they are wearable, minimal, and, um, and portable. Um, even electrodermal dermal activity can be um, applied in the future, we hope, as a wristband. Um, it is being now used for, um, um, for a detection of epilepsy and um, for path psychophysiological arousal, but maybe in the future, if that is more, that if more data is available, um, that would be something um, of um, attraction. This is a, a recent study published in um, November last year by one of the authors of our group um, ha that has shown that um, four uh, independently EEG-based um, factors um, combined together in one model, uh, that is delta variability, high beta variability, relative theta power, and relative alpha power, altogether contributed to um, a better detection of those patients who were delirious versus those that were not with a um, reasonable or good area under the curve of 0 0.94. Now for my final remarks, modern ICU should separate high-tech environments and noisy alarm systems from the patient and accommodation, um, remote, simple, minimally invasive and reliable monitoring of not only delirium, but sedation and anxiety, um, also provision of sleep, the presence of advanced neuromonitoring, um, even as mentioned before with the bispectral index, as the initial state or the NIRS, um, there is a starting point to that. And the rethinking of the ICU outline and the equipment use and how much we, we put into the patient space, um, how much information and how much... Um, uh, stimulus is there. So the suggestion is for a, he a healing environment. Now, is delirium a bad thing altogether? If you ask the patients, if you ask us, we see those patients and we, by um, default, would say it is disturbing. It ha we know um, through studies it has ha been associated with bad outcome. But I would like you to um, listen to a story, a recent story from a patient of ours in the ICU, what he thought about his experience. The delirium and hallucinations I experienced, although it may sound strange, helped me get through it all. My subconsciousness was got disconnected from the sense of threat, and my brain showed me images composed partly from childhood memories, partly from recent experiences. But mostly there were films drawing plots from my whole life and stimuli coming to me there in the room on a regular basis. I did not feel fear. And I was not aware of what was happening to me. And although it may sound cruel, mainly for the sake of my loved ones, if I had died then in this delirium, it would have been a good death. I was really surprised to, to, um, to read that. Um, but the patient um, shared, uh, gave me permission to share that thought, um, that he would have died peacefully if it was in that delirium. Now, for the delirium to be a lesser issue, um, it is always teamwork. It is always the people who care for the patient, who detect delirium, who um, pick up the wording, who um, provide care, and uh, who restore normality. So it's not just the, no the ICU design, but the humane approach and um, identifying the, the non-ICU um, problems or interactions and the even uh, financial burden that the patient, uh, patient and the family will be dealing with. Um, simple measures of, of dressing the patient and um, letting them get showered. So is it possible to have a delirium-free um, ICU if we move on with the uh, um, with the technology to have reliable and innovative assessment tools, maybe, um, for sure with good sedation practices, um, and whether novel ICU design and connectivity is the way to go. That uh, are studies that have shown that already, but um, maybe the new design ICUs will be more and more um, useful to provide um, data. Um, facilitating non-pharmacological sedation and um, um, comfort and also balanced um, pharmacological interventions. And with that, I thank you.
Thank you very much. That's actually a really lovely talk to end the session in. Um, any comments or questions from the audience at all? Uh, there's uh, one gentleman. Yeah, would you stand up, please? Thank you. Thank you for your talk. A quick question about whether there was any discussion of virtual reality playing a role in reduction of delirium in the future. Yes, absolutely. We um, also introduced that um, as one of the one of the options, and the, um, some there are some ongoing small studies um, introducing virtual reality to reorientate the patient and also for cognitive um, um, support of those that we know. Um, and not uh, cognitively, inta cognitively intact. So absolutely you're right, I, I didn't mention that, but we, we did um, in um, involve the VR into that future design. Any other comments? Sorry, I didn't see. Um, so I had an observation, not really a question, but um, I love the idea of um, the design of what ITU could look like, um, and it's a hotel room probably, but actually what, what might be more interesting is the environment that should reflect the patient's home um, and their environment. So, you know, for someone who's used to the countryside, that might be very appropriate, but for other patients, that might not be what they're used to and um, maybe more interesting to find out what they're used to and provide that for them to have that home environment so they can reorientate themselves. I, I think that's a very good remark and um, it is just looking at what the patient needs are and what they have had coming into the unit. We know very little. We know the um, pathophysiological der derangements. We look at the um, syndromes and symptoms, but we don't know what um, was their world as it ended with the critical illness. No, I think I don't see any other questions than the sun has come out. So I'm going to say a much a big thank you. thank you for all the speakers today. A really fascinating session. Thank you very much. And safe journey home. <laughs>